Okay, good morning, uh, happy new year, and uh, welcome everyone um, for this course where we will cover a couple of books of the Bible. So we're going to cover Hebrews, we will cover James, First and Second Peter, and uh, the book of Jude. Uh, this is DC three zero seven. We will have two assessments, both of uh, fifty marks each for all the modes. So whether you're an on-campus, online, or e-learning student, we will have two assessments. Please make sure to um, attempt and uh, complete both the assessments in order for you to, to clear uh, the course. And uh, also, I uh, want to encourage that uh, we those who are online on campus to maintain your attendance uh, also, please, at 85%. Uh, so, uh, this morning, let's uh, just get started with our course here. Uh, we will read mostly from NKJV version of the Bible. So that will be uh, the, the version that we use for the classes. Uh, you're free to you know, look up other versions for your better understanding of, of the word. Uh, and we are going to follow through with um, EnduringWord.com. Uh, that's a commentary by David uh, Guzik, and we are using his commentary primarily, but then, you know, that there's a little bit of content from elsewhere as well. So, again, you're free to refer to uh, David Guzik's commentary and additional commentaries uh, that you prefer. So, let's start off with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get into the book of Hebrews today. So, let me just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We worship and honor you. We thank you, Lord, for this time in your presence and the opportunity to learn your word. Father, we pray that your word will come alive. Uh, and Father God, that uh, you will help us, oh God, to uh, be so strong uh, in the faith, Father, that, that uh, we can fulfill the purposes that you have, Lord, for each one of us. Father, this morning we commit uh, all our concerns um, and, uh, Father, uh, anything, Lord, that, that may be weighing heavily upon our hearts into your hands, we pray for, uh, uh, Lord, the power of God to be demonstrated and reveal uh, your glory, Father God. Father, we speak blessing upon uh, all the students uh, and their families as well. Father, especially, Lord, as we look ahead at the new year, Lord, we, we pray, uh, let this be a glorious year, Father, uh, a year with greater glory. We uh, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So the book of Hebrews, a very, very interesting study for all of us. We will begin with an introduction uh, and understand who wrote the book, you know, when it was written. So then it gives us some context when we read what has been written by the author. So as far as the authorship of the book is concerned, uh, the author does not identify uh, himself or herself. Okay, we generally in the epistles that Paul wrote, we notice that he uh, openly says, you know, a Paul, uh, an apostle called by God, Paul, a bond servant of Christ. So he introduces himself. But the unique thing about the book of Hebrews is that the writer doesn't uh, openly introduce himself or herself. So then that has given place for some speculation about who the author could be. Now, there are people who state that uh, Hebrews was also written by Paul simply because it's around, around the time when Paul was alive. And they, they also noticed that some of the teachings which we observe in the book of Hebrews uh, can only come from someone who understands the Jewish culture very well. And we know that Paul was a learned person, and uh, thereby he would have had the capacity to write the way uh, Hebrews is written. Along with this, the teachings in here are in harmony 
with the teachings of Paul. So there's no contradiction. So even though the name of the author is not mentioned and the style of writing is somewhat different from your usual letters, so it starts with an introduction and then addressing different matters and then uh, you know, closing off with greetings, blessings, thank yous. Uh, that's not the style of the book of Hebrews. So it's like a prose. It's uh, you know, it's it's a lot of text uh, given here. It's quite different from the letters of Paul. And so uh, maybe he wrote it, but why did he write it differently? So that's a that's question that arises. So people think it could be Paul, but then we can't clearly say that it is him. Uh, now, other matters that, you know, we, we see in some of the passages is, in Hebrews 11.32, uh, the author uh, identifies himself in the masculine grammar, apparently, you know, in, in the Hebrew language. And so that has uh, made people think that the writer could be a male personality. Now, whether it's Paul or not, we are not, you know, we can't tell 100% because it's not uh, written in there. But who else you know if you say another male personality who else could it be there is speculation people think that it could be barnabas uh, because he uh, was a levite and he may had have had knowledge about the jewish traditions and uh, the, the temple practices and some others speculate that it could be apollos because uh, he was also uh, a very learned person so all of this is speculation but at the end of the day the writer does not identify himself. So uh, I don't know if you've heard this, but I have a lot of uh, people dealing with the text of the Hebrews would simply say the writer of the Hebrews, whereas some others will boldly say Paul says. So we leave it you know, at, at that. Whoever uh, thinks that you know, uh, this particular person has written, they are, they are using uh, that name in their messages or their writings. Uh, but yeah, so that's how it is. The, the writer is not clearly identified. So what is the time when this uh, book was written? Uh, it is said that it was written somewhere between 67 to 69 AD. Okay? And uh, also, another thing for us to note, at this time duration, uh, the temple was still there because the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem happened uh, you know, around 70 AD. So then we also recognize that whatever the writer is talking about, you'll, you'll see references to you know, temple, sacrifices, priests. So the practices were probably still going on. And the writer, with that understanding, has put it across. For us, so maybe you know that the, the temple was still there; it was not yet destroyed, and that is why the writer was able to present uh, those pictures here in the book of Hebrews, so 67 to 69 AD, before the destruction of the temple. Literary form, uh, I've already said, it's not written like a letter, but it's written more like an essay uh, in the Hebrew language. Um, and who are the people that it was written to? Uh, it is said that this letter was written to persecuted Jewish believers or persecuted Jewish Christians. So people who started moving away from Judaism, uh, they, they were passionately following Christ, but then there was persecution. You know, they were opposed uh, and they also may have gone through losses because they would have lost the rights and privileges that they had among their own Jewish families. Uh, even in the society or the community, people may have excluded them from you know, their gatherings or, or uh, uh, some celebrations. Uh, and it is also speculated that these people may have undergone greater losses, such as uh, uh, their property being taken away from them or some opportunities being taken away from them. So being a Jewish Christian was not an easy thing. 
uh, because you would you would have people against you uh, and the writer of the hebrews is trying to uh, work with the knowledge and information that these jewish christians already had they knew about worship and uh, priests and sacrifices so he is uh, through all of this knowledge he is reiterating that new found christian faith and encouraging them and letting them know uh, you know how much how, how what they are in right now is the fulfillment of all the traditions that they have been following so far so he is really bringing a word of encouragement to the persecuted believers and helping them stand strong in the lord so this is whom the book has been written to uh, so what is the purpose of this book as i said encouragement mainly for the jewish believers but uh, apart from this you know it's uh, one of those rich uh, rich every word of god is rich but i am just trying to say that when it comes to the revelation of who the lord jesus is his deity his redemptive work and how complete that redemptive work is um, uh, you know and uh, uh, the the trinity so many so many of these uh, doctrinal concepts are beautifully explained and uh, i would also say explained with depth in the book of hebrews uh, and, and i don't even know which which uh, which year this is that i'm teaching how many times i have taught the book of hebrews but every time i prepare and i teach uh, i feel like wow this this just gets better it just gets deeper uh, and the same scripture seems to you know bring forth uh, incredible meaning and uh, revelation so it's a beautiful book with so much depth particularly when it comes to the doctrine uh, that we hold on to uh, and another thing so first i said is encouragement second i said is uh, the the uh, revelation right uh, that we find here especially about the lord jesus christ his deity doctrines uh, it, it's all uh, encompassed in the book of hebrews and the third one is we will also find uh, a warning in the book of hebrews so uh, from time to time the author will remind the jewish christians and tell them look just because you're going through difficulty uh, to give up and go back to judaism uh, you know it, it it it's not the right thing to do like don't give up hold on and he also warns them about uh, pushing it too far so uh, in hebrews chapter 6 we'll come to a passage where he talks about those who give up and go away from god and they even lose their faith uh, and so these consequences are quite dire and therefore uh, he's warning them and saying you know don't go uh, away from god don't go back to the earlier practices because it's convenient comfortable uh, and uh, it, it will uh, once again give you that that feeling of of being received by the community around you stand strong for the lord even if it is difficult and uh, god will reward you so it, it's a warning to not turn away from god and not to turn back from god so let me just pause here I quickly check with all of us if you've ever done uh, a study on the book of hebrews and uh, uh, if if at all you know you you have any thoughts to to share please let us know Or okay, if, even if you've not done a study, any any uh, any thoughts? I'm sure we've read the book of Hebrews. So, what comes to your mind when you think about the book of Hebrews? I think the book is so intense. Uh, yeah. So much of revelation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it takes a lot. Uh, kind of, it takes. A lot of time to meditate and uh, get the crisp of it, and it's it's so so profound, so so deep. Yeah. And it also correlates with all the Old Testament heroes. 
um, yes. and reminding us about our faith and yes. yeah, it's so profound. Let's say. Sure, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, John. That's that's true. Thank you so much for sharing. Anyone else? Um, I've read the book a couple of times, and uh, I like how it shows that uh, about angels and God, the differentiation. Uh, and I feel in Christology we have uh, we have seen this where it says that Jesus is God, and uh, yeah, that's one of the things I like. And about even high priest, how it's compared with Jesus, I just feel like as you said, it's it's more about a, a deeper revelation of Jesus. Uh, one of the things that we uh, get in this book, uh, like how in the Old Testament and the New Testament are, are beautifully compared, uh, that full expression of uh, Jesus. I remember reading uh, Hebrews even as I started this year, and uh, I was just asking God that, one of the things that I want to do this year is to just know more uh, about you. That's one thought that God put in my heart as I started 24. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so I think similar to what John shared, depth, revelation, especially revelation of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. So uh, let's begin and uh, uh, let's see what we can uh, get out of chapter one this morning. Uh, let's begin by reading the entire passage. So that's what we'll do. We'll quickly read through chapter one, and then I'll come back and explain portions of the first chapter. Uh, so would one of you like to read through the whole thing, or we can have two people read two different portions? Maybe uh, one person can read six verses and the next person the remaining seven verses. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, Rosalind, would you like to like to read the next couple of verses, please. Should I continue? And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? 
Amen. Thank you, Gosling. Thank you for reading through the entire passage. Uh, let's come back to the first few verses and try and understand oh, what God is speaking to us here. So as we begin, uh, the writer here starts off, I, I told us there's no introduction as such. And uh, it's amazing that he starts with the word God. This also tells us that he is sure that he's speaking to a, a, a believing crowd. Um, and when we say God, of course, with the rest of what is written, we can affirm that he's speaking to the Jewish people. They already have an idea about who this God is. So he doesn't try to explain it further. It just starts with God, meaning you already know this is the God of you know the Yahweh God, this God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, I'm talking about that God. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past. So he's revealing to us the manner in which God, uh, the nature of God and the manner in which he wants to relate to us. He is almighty, all-powerful, and we talk about the attributes of God, uh, where we say that you know he is uh, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. But having these attributes, he still wants to relate to us. That's so beautiful. Because in various times and in various ways, he spoke. He communicated to us. Uh, and he still communicates with us. Right? And so we have this uh, whole uh, desire for the prophetic. What is God speaking to us now? We, we, we want to know that. I know we've done a course on the prophetic as well. So he's a speaking God. And he spoke to our fathers by the prophets in time past. Now, God has spoken throughout ages, uh, and particularly he points to the prophets under the old, uh, you know, in the Old Testament times. But the writer is talking about the greatest message ever spoken by God. Okay, so, among everything that the Lord has spoken, if there is one thing, that the writer chooses to emphasize it is about the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message coming forth to us. And that's what he's letting the people know. That God right now, meaning in their times, has spoken in the best way possible and the best message possible. And that message is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, excuse me, he says in verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Last days, simply referring to the time, you know, after uh, the, the death, burial, resurrection uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are technically in the last days. So right now, the greatest message that God has spoken to us is through his son. And notice, uh, we are told about God and his son. So though we, we don't have this term called Trinity input into uh, the book of Hebrews, we will find that in some places there is a beautiful picture of the Trinity emerging. So God and his son, part of the Trinity. Uh, he has spoken to us by his son. And now he's talking about the attributes of the Son of God, uh, where he, the whole of the first chapter is telling us that Jesus is Lord. You know, Jesus is God. He's part of the Trinity. And so he describes the attributes of the Son of God. And he says he has appointed heir over all things. Being heir over everything is a picture of lordship. So when we say the Lord Jesus Christ and we talk about him being crucified on the cross of Calvary, we know about his redemptive work. But it's not just limited to that. 
the Lord Jesus, as Jeffina was saying, Christology, when we study about who he is, uh, in, in you know, being fully man, fully God, there are all these aspects that we have to consider, one of which the, the writer is pointing to, and he says, appointed heir of all things, meaning look at Jesus as Lord, ruler, okay? Uh, and and he, he reigns over everything, through whom also he made the worlds. So describing the activity of creation, uh, sometimes we would say that, you know, the uh, God, he spoke, let there be light, and we attribute creation to the Father. Uh, and, and sometimes people focus more on the spirit. The spirit of the Lord was hovering upon the waters. And, and you know, uh, we know that brooding is, is a reproductive term. So the spirit of God is involved with creation. But the writer of the Hebrews is letting us know that the Son of God is also involved in creation, through whom also he made the worlds. So the worlds were made through the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is uh, there, there is his involvement in creation itself. So it's really beautiful that he's reminding us and he's telling us, look, God spoke in so many ways in the past. While all those messages are beautiful, we uh, can enlist. You know, God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. We could say, you know, Elijah uh, through a still small voice. All of which are really, uh, you know, things that we talk about. Hey, God spoke like this, or you know, Isaiah through a heavenly vision. But beyond all the beauty and the magnificence of the way God has communicated, the best way in which He has communicated is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and uh, uh, we are being told that. He is part of creation, the work of creation. And he's the author of the worlds. The author of the worlds, that, that term there, the Greek word is uh, aeon, okay, aeon, which refers to ages and history itself. All right. So uh, this is the manner in which uh, this book has been written, revealing the deity of Christ. Okay, uh, just a quick uh, uh, correction. I think when I started out introducing the book, I, I said the Hebrew language, so my apologies. Greek. Okay, so it's uh, written in the Greek language. Uh, uh, though the name of the book is Hebrews, it is written to the Hebrew believers or the or the uh, Jewish believers. But uh, the text here that we we are uh, we we have to interpret is in the Greek. So. Right, so let's move on. Verse 3, uh, he says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Okay, it's too power packed to, uh, you know, sort of unpack quickly and keep moving on with the next verse. But what, what is the writer trying to reveal in, in these uh, words? He says, Who being the brightness of his glory. So, you know, when we look at, uh, let's say, you consider a source of light, if it's dim, uh, let's imagine the source of light is in this room and we are in the other room and some rays are reaching us. If it's dim, we can easily say that, yeah, okay, maybe it's a, a whatever, you know, low, uh, low wat wattage bulb. Uh, or if it's super bright, we could say, hey, it's coming from a powerful source of light because the rays are so powerful. Uh, and in the same way, he's trying to give us an analogy here about the Lord Jesus. He says, being the brightness of his glory. So the Lord Jesus is like that ray of light. Imagine, he is the one who has created all this, the sun and all the stars. And uh, what would be his brightness? The one who is the brightest of them all. Okay. Uh, the brightness of his glory. Jesus is like that ray of light. And through that ray of light, we are able to understand who God is. Okay? So God, Jesus is representing God or the Father. And as we look at the glory of the Lord Jesus, we get an idea about the glory 
of the Father, the glory of the Godhead. So he, when he came here to our world, he shone so bright by his character, by his ministry, uh, right? By the power in which he moved. And uh, that's why he says the brightness of his glory, so powerful, the life of Jesus. Uh, everything he said, everything he did, just by observing, studying the life of Jesus, you recognize, oh, this is who God is, you know, so just, so holy, uh, uh, so uh, mighty, so loving. Uh, and, and he shone bright the glory of God among us. Uh, that's the Lord Jesus. And the express image of his person, express image of his person is somewhat um, to say, you know, when, when letters go out, and uh, uh, we may have a stamp. Uh, uh, all our organization institutions do this. We have a seal. Put that seal. Now, each time we can't recreate the logo or the emblem. So we just carry a seal. We just you know, uh, dip it in ink and we stamp it out on our letters. And the same seal goes out. Uh, and it, it represents the same thing, right? Uh, it, it represents who we stand for, what we believe. And in that manner, the writer is saying, you know, Jesus is the stamp. Like he's that express image, exact image, that exact. If this is God, it's like this. When you stamp, you get the same picture, same image. Or you could even say like a mirror image, exact image of God. And that's what Jesus came to do, to represent God well to us. So he's the brightness of his glory, uh, and he's also the express image of the person of God. Now, I want to understand God. Who is God? We can understand God by the names that God revealed to us. The covenant names we keep saying, right? Jehovah, um, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, uh, covenant God who provides covenant God of healing, you know, covenant God of peace. Through the names of God, we can understand who he is. You know, Adonai, El Shaddai, Elohim. We recognize, oh, this is the God that we serve. We recognize him through his works, what he did for the Israelites, how he, uh, you know, went before uh, Joshua and the people and the miracles, uh, Elijah, the God of Elijah, the God of Elisha. And we get a picture an awesome God. This is who he is. But the writer of the Hebrews is now adding to that. And he's saying, when you look at Jesus, you understand who God really is. You can understand him by his names, by his works, but primarily we understand him by the person of our Lord Jesus because he is the express image of his person. So for me to know God, Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. You need to know me. You need to accept what I have done for you. And uh, through me is salvation. Jesus is the express image of God. Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus is revealing the Father to us. And the next part here, upholding all things by the word of his power. Think about this. What holds the universe? Because we can describe all the scientific philosophies and you know principles that we know and uh, work out some mathematical uh, you know algorithms uh, to explain how the stars are suspended uh, in the universe, how the planets are suspended. But the writer of the Hebrews, in line with describing the lordship of Jesus Christ is now saying to us, you know how God upholds this world, the universe, everything in its place, you know, by the word of his power. He said, and there was light. He said and created. And the heavens were created by the, by the word of God. Psalm uh, 33 reminds us of that. So the whole universe is second place by the power, the word of his power, it says, instead of you know, the power of his word, the word of his power. So this is how God is sustaining the world. Now, a small question to you and me. 
what about our lives? You know, if I may just for comparison's sake say a small little lives in comparison to the universe. The whole universe is sustained by the word of his power. Why can't your life and my life be sustained by the word of his power? And we know, right, when we read the book of John, uh, he's the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And so we must embrace the word of his power and let it really work in our lives. Uh, so it's again talking about Jesus, how he's the radiance of God. You know, the brightness of his glory, another word, uh, is the radiance of God, uh, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, now again, talking about the redemptive work of God. Why did he come here to the earth with the mandate of taking the sins of the world upon himself? and paying uh, our price on the cross so that we could be we could be set free from the wrath of god so there's a reference to purging our sins and notice it says uh, when he had by himself you know that again is so beautiful because god could have uh, done it any other way you know get your best angel get your uh, best prophet, or something like that. Or create another creature and say, okay, go, you bring redemption for mankind. But the love of God for us to do a complete work and a just work uh, is, is such that he by himself purged our sins. And the next thing, again, okay, so very beautiful sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, a description of the uh, Trinity up in heaven. God is in heaven. Where is Jesus? At the right hand of the majesty. So uh, God, one God, three persons, Hebrews talks about it. So Jesus is at the right hand of the majesty. Majesty referring to Father God. Uh, and he sat down. He sat down. I think in uh, the book of Acts, I explained that where sitting down is a picture of having completed a task or an assignment which was given to us. So we sit down after we have finished. Jesus on the cross, when he hung, what did he say? It is finished. I've done the work of it. I completed it. Okay, and now. Uh, ahead of him was the, the promise of the Father that he spoke to the disciples about. And he himself ascended up into heaven. And when he went up into heaven, he sat down. Because he had completed what God called him to do. Uh, all right. So moving forward from there, what do we see? Verse 4. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So it is said, commentators say, that another problem during the times of, uh, uh, you know, this, this uh, Hebrew believers was the worship of angels, which is why the writer had to clarify and say that the Lord Jesus is God. He is the Son of God. He is creator. He is the very representation of God, whereas the angels are not. And the angels are subject to this Lord Jesus Christ. And he's coming to that point. The verses that follow will talk about angels uh, and the comparison between Jesus and the angels. Right here in verse 4, he's saying, having become so much better than the angels. So obviously, he's higher than the angels. So what's the comparison? Jesus is creator. Angels are created. You see? So you cannot even equate the two. Because it, it's completely different. And so he's greater. He's so much better than the angels. Now, how is he better than the angels? One that is po pointed here or listed here is by inheritance. 
meaning the father has a son and it's not an angel it's the lord jesus christ are angels the you know sons or uh, i know in some places they are termed as sons sons of god but that doesn't mean you know uh, in the context that we are speaking the trinity being co-equal with god they are not only jesus is co-equal with god uh, and you know the second personality in the trinity so by inheritance that way it's only the lord jesus who's the son of god he has obtained a more excellent name than they so uh, very clearly the writer is saying look jesus is greater now by inheritance he has a great name but remember when we uh, read in philippians chapter 2 we see that the lord jesus humbled himself and obtained a name that is greater than any other name so even through his obedience to the father not just inheritance now sometimes we look at it like oh look at this person they just inherited a fortune and they became the king or they became the boss uh, they became the you know uh, whoever top ranking uh, official in the company just by inheritance but in the case of jesus that's true as a son he inherited a, a, a more excellent name but also through his life his character his obedience and we read about that in scripture as well so he was not that uh, uh, you know disobedient son who just inherited the father's uh, legacy no it's the other way around though he could be so proud and you know claim uh, superiority over people uh, he was still so humble by inheritance he was already the son of god but even by action by character by humility uh, he obtained a more excellent name and we read about that in philippians chapter 2 so just want to check how you all are doing if you're still there if you're still awake <laughs> and uh, still uh, tuned in okay is that a yes or a no yes pastor yes pastor okay okay thank you anyone else yes okay great thank you so much colin is also here okay yes brother collins thank you so much for confirming thank you everyone good to know that uh, you know you are with me so let's see we'll probably cover a little bit more before we wrap up for today uh, all right so coming to verse 5 uh, here says for to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son today i have begotten you and again i will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son but when he again brings the first born into the world he says that all the angels of god worship him and of the angels he says who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire so very clearly again the writer is reiterating the relationship that god has with the son and the position of the angels and who angels really are and as i stated earlier this is possibly to uh, uh sort of if there was a wrong teaching about worshiping angels the author wanted to destroy it because the only one whom we should worship is the lord jesus and not any angels so these scriptures here these verses here also reveal to us the knowledge and understanding of the writer of the hebrews because he is literally quoting from the old testament and you will notice that the book of hebrews is one of those books where a lot of quotes from the old testament have been included so that reveals to us the knowledge of the writer of the old testament scriptures that he was really uh, a, a very adept student of the word of god so these passages are from psalm chapter 2 so one of the verses that's quoted is psalm 27 another one is from second samuel 7 and verse 14 uh, where it's god speaking to his son and not calling the angels his son so for his son which is the lord jesus there's terms used such as begotten okay begotten not created 
we got it. And uh, the other term here is firstborn into the world. All of this attributing to the Lord Jesus Christ and his greatness um, and his relationship with the Father. Uh, and again, you know, a picture of the Trinity. I already mentioned that to us. You have terms like the Father, to uh, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. All this is spoken to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he has not spoken this to the angels. That's the point that he's trying to make. But what about the angels then? He's saying, let all the angels of God worship him. So angels as created beings are subject to God Almighty. Okay, They, are, they actually need to be worshipping God. And who angels are is also described for us because he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So who are angels? So angels are but... Uh, they are spirit, we already know that, and they are ministers, meaning they have been created by God to serve. And we'll see later on, verse 14, there is a reference to angels serving those who are born again and who are part of the kingdom of God. So angels are supposed to worship Jesus because he is God and he is Lord, and they are but created spirits who must be subject to the Lordship uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they are ministers. Yes, they are powerful ministers. It says his ministers a flame of fire. Sometimes uh, this scripture is quoted for uh, ministers, as in not angels per se, but men and women of God who are serving. But it's okay because it, the essence is, Correct. Powerful ministers. The Lord surely equips his ministers, right, with the anointing, the grace, uh, and, and all of that. So, uh, but the verse as such is referring to angels who are serving spirits. So, ministers means uh, those who are in service. Now, worship, the word worship there in the Greek, where it says, let all the angels of God worship him. I'll just explain that word and stop for today. The word worship is uh, the word proskunu. It's Greek. Okay, so I don't know if I'm pronouncing it uh, correct. But proskunu means uh, literally like lying pros prostrate. Uh, so think about that picture of worship. Worship is to like sort of be in that position of surrender before God, uh, where we are lying prostrate. I know we don't do it physically each time, but hopefully that's the position of our heart, where we are before the Lord, submitted to the Lord. And uh, uh, it, it's also said that that word means to, to kiss, or sometimes, uh, you know, when we see maybe a pet a dog licking the master's foot, like it's, it's, adoring the master and it's it's um, you know just in the presence of the master even that apparently is what this word means so it's as if to say we completely surrender to god you know we we lie prostrate before him uh, it, it's it's going close to god and in our adoration you know just just adoring the lord as if you know, this word uh, kiss is, is mentioned here, or like uh, someone who is at the feet of their master, just looking up unto the master. That is worship. And the writer says the duty or the responsibility of angels is to worship our Lord Jesus because he is so worthy of our worship. Uh, but I just want to translate that to us and say even we must be worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ. So with that, uh, it's a wrap on today's class. And just to re reassure our class based on our discussion yesterday, so uh, discussions are, uh, you, uh, resolution for your concerns is underway. Uh, please do give me a little bit of time so that I can uh, get back to you. And uh, yeah, so maybe we can just pray and close for today. Uh, would anyone like to lead in prayer, please?
Let's pray. Yes. Father Almighty yes. God, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for enlightening our brains. King of glory, there is nothing we can pay for but only to glorify your name. Let your word continue reigning in our life. Let it change us. Let it give, help us to do the great commission that we are called for. We pray and declare this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless you. And uh, I really hope that you are enjoying the book of Hebrews. Bye for now.